Good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us today to learn more about client nurturing and how with the right programs in place you can increase your firm's revenue. My name is Victoria Stowall and I am the Vice President of Strategic Planning and Marketing for Amicus Creative Media. I know many of you on this call today are clients of Amicus Creative, but for those of you not familiar with us and what we do, we are a leading website development firm working exclusively with attorneys. Since our founding in 2007, we've met dozens of really great professionals across the legal industry who have been able to help our clients in an assortment of ways. This year, one of our goals was to develop a webinar series where we would feature these experts and have them share their insights with attorneys looking to propel their practices. Today, we're thrilled to have Brian McCarthy joining us to discuss measures you can take offline to reach out to clients, reestablish close communications, generate incremental legal revenue, and restore original goodwill. Before we get started here, I did have just a few housekeeping notes. Uh, first off, you are muted on your end, so uh, no need to mute your phone or turn off your microphone on your computer. If you do have any questions, uh, we will be having a Q&A at the end of the presentation here. When you signed on to GoToWebinar, you should have seen just a small Citrix uh, control panel pop up. In this control panel, you'll find a field where you can type in any questions. Please feel free to send those over throughout the course of the presentation, but like I said, we'll be answering them at the end. And finally, we will be recording this presentation. I know attorneys often get called away uh, during the course of the webinar, so if that is the case today, please just let us know and we can send you a link to the full recording. So now let me tell you just a bit about our speaker here before we get started. Uh, Brian McCarthy is president of Brian McCarthy Marketing, a client nurturing and strategic planning company offering a variety of marketing solutions. Brian brings 35 years of marketing and sales experience to this business. Most of his experience was spent at the vice president's level for both large and small companies in the Northeast. Today he works with attorneys across the country with strategic planning, client retention and nurturing campaigns, client referral, and client conversion campaigns. We first met Brian when he was working with our, one of our clients uh, who raved about his work and strategies for success. Since that time, we've had a handful of other firms work closely with him, and they too have seen great success. So we're really in for a real treat today and are sure to learn a lot from him. So with that being said, I'm going to go ahead and uh, turn the floor over to Brian. Well, thank you so much, Ricky. Thank you for your kind words. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm very happy to be here with you today. I hope I can provide uh, insight into some very simple and economical client and nurturing techniques that can help your practice. Now, most of my work has been done with estate planning, elder law, and probate administration law firms. If you have another type of practice, you probably benefit from listening, since many of my techniques are universal. Most of my presentations are in person or involve telephone calls or conference calls. So just bit, uh, sit back and I'll tell you uh, what I do. At the very beginning, I'd like to point out that I am not a lawyer. I work closely with lawyers, especially estate planning attorneys, and I've actually learned a few things over the years. But I have to be very careful. Occasionally I'm asked a question that borders on the law. This usually happens at a conference or at a seminar. And sometimes I'm, I may even know the correct answer to the question, but immediately I have to inform the question that I'm not a lawyer. I quickly then recommend a lawyer who can't answer the question properly. And I usually recommend one of my clients. I'd also like to point out that I'm aware of the variations found in the rules of professional conduct in the different jurisdictions across the country. My client nurturing efforts are, are extremely simple and non-controversial and they're authorized wherever I've helped a law firm. But I do ask that my clients always check with their uh, disciplinary counsels to make sure everything we do is okay, at least in their jurisdiction. I'll give you an example. I, I love client testimonials. You'll see a number of testimonials sprinkled throughout my presentation this afternoon, testimonials from my clients. They're a simple and effective way to emphasize a point. Now, I'm told that client testimonials are allowed just about everywhere in legal circles, but there are some jurisdictions that require a disclaimer of some kind. A disclaimer that might say past client testimonials are not an indication of future client success, or words to that effect. 
if I work with a client in a jurisdiction that has such a requirement, we'd simply include the profit disclaimer on our promotional materials. Uh, that being said, let me tell you how I got started. I had a very interesting career in the marketing and sales of luxury goods, gold jewelry, Swiss timepieces, elegant writing instruments. I worked for U.S. manufacturers and importers, and we marketed this merchandise to retailers such as Tiffany & Company, Zale Corporation, uh, department stores in New York City and across the country, and independent jewelers across the country also. I learned a lot working with these retailers. I learned about creative and effective marketing concepts, about human psychology. Uh, you, I learned about common sense. Well, you're probably thinking, what's all this got to do with the legal profession? Well, in 2008, I took an early retirement, and I eventually found out that I had a lot of time on my hands. I understand this is common with people who've had active careers. I traveled extensively around the world doing business in Europe and Asia and in 49 of our 50 states. Now, my wife teaches school, and when she went to back, back to her classroom that September of that year, I, I realized I still had skills that I'd like to put to good use. So I started uh, helping some of my friends who uh, own small businesses. One friend was a local estate planning attorney. He used to live next door to me. Within just a couple of months, some of the suggestions I made regarding his practice started to pay off. He was amazed at how well they worked. He'd say things like, I should have thought of this myself, or I should have started something like this years ago. The concepts worked so well that he asked me to talk to another solo estate planning attorney who was his, his friend. And the same thing happened. That led to a third attorney, then a fourth. I've now helped dozens of law firms using the very similar, what I call, client nurturing concepts that I use with my first few clients. Now, by the way, the, the concepts it did evolve over the years. By this I mean the things that worked well uh, were expanded. Things that didn't work so well were eliminated. Now, one example uh, of something that was eliminated was Google AdWords. I had terrific su uh, success with AdWords in other businesses. And there's a reason that Google has grown so quickly. AdWords really work, but for some reason that I can't explain, they just didn't seem to work for my estate planning attorneys. The good news is Google allows you to test AdWords for a very modest fee, so when the test didn't work out, nobody lost very much money. Let's talk about features and benefits as we get started here. A lot of businesses mix them up, and that's a real mistake. Features are what you can do. Websites are full of features. They're generally statements of your ability. Here are features of a typical estate planning law firm. These are nice to know uh, for a potential client, but what he really wants to know is, what can you do for me? In other words, what's in it for me? And the answer to that question comes in the form of the benefits. Now, you can generalize some benefits, but before you can clearly show a client the benefits to that to he or she uh, and just how you can help them, you have to meet with them privately and hear their story, as you know, and understand their needs and wishes. Then you can draft a list of benefits so your clients can make a decision and move forward. Try to keep your features and benefits separate. Remember, features tell, benefits sell. Now, just about everything we talk about this afternoon will be about getting existing clients and potential clients into your office so you can draft a list of benefits uh, for them. In an age of email, and teleconferences, Skype, nothing, there's nothing better than a face-to-face -face meeting to explain your benefits to your clients. Uh, by the way, I love Skype. I use it all the time with my family, and I have friends in, U in Europe. We use it every week. However, I don't recommend Skype for law firms for the simple reason it's not a, a secure transmission. Let's define a client nurturing uh, campaign. These are a series of sequential and cumulative efforts to generate incremental revenue and help build prosperous law firms. Now, I'm going to start with uh, some of the benefits to you of a client nurturing campaign. Then later we can talk about the features that bring us to those benefits. The first and most important benefit is incremental revenue. 
Client nurturing campaigns do generate incremental revenue, usually within the first few months. And that revenue should continue as long as the campaign stay vac stays active. Why? Because you have, you'll have an increase uh, in incremental visitors to your office. Starting with the existing clients. Now, some will only need a small amount of work. Maybe powers of attorney need to be updated. Maybe certain assets have not been funded properly and are not in the original trust. Other clients may need a complete rework of their entire estate plan. This testimonial is uh, from one of my early clients who was kind enough to share uh, his financial information. Most of my clients keep this, this kind of stuff to themselves. But one reason this client was able to track this performance was he had an absolutely terrific legal assistant who recorded every aspect of his, of his campaign on an Excel spreadsheet. By the way, this uh, was the same young lady who admitted to me later on in the year that she was very skeptical at first. But later that year, she thanked me when she received a nice salary increase and a nice bonus at holiday time. The firm had a very good year. So incremental revenue was one of our key benefits and certainly one of our key goals. The next benefit is the creation of a large amount of goodwill. And this came as a bit of a surprise uh, to me. I hadn't thought too much about goodwill when I first designed these campaigns. But then lawyer after lawyer started commenting on how happy their clients were. And they were happy because they finally got some attention in an area they didn't like to think about. Their existing clients who knew that too much time had gone by without seeing their attorney. They knew there had been some changes in the law, and they certainly knew about the changes in their own personal life. They were happy to deal with these issues now and get back to a state of relative uh, peace of mind. One attorney asked me, what do we do with all this goodwill? And the answer to a question like that from any marketing professional should always be, you ask for referrals. And I'll talk more about this in a few minutes. Uh, by the way, a lot of marketing people do a good job of uh, taking nice pitches for the law firm's website, creating nice brochures and email newsletters and even blogging. And when somebody asks me what I do, my uh, elevator speech uh, is I, I create incremental revenue for law firms, and in the process I create a lot of goodwill, which usually leads to referrals. So the next benefit is a... Uh, is an increase in referrals. How do you do that? You ask. You satisfied clients for referrals. We're also going to talk more about this a little, a little bit later. I'll show you a simple and painless way to ask for referrals. If you start a client nurturing campaign, you'll learn a lot about your client database. You'll learn who's still around, who's moved away, who is now deceased, who's found a new attorney, who is missing in action. Over time, you'll wind up with what I call a refresh client database that can easily be maintained as you go forward. This refresh client database will also be extremely valuable if you ever want to merge or sell your law firm down the road. And finally, you can develop a very important uniqueness. You can do this by over-servicing your clients. You have to find a way to be somehow unique in this marketplace to survive. The unfortunate reality is that if your services that you offer are the same as your competition, you're in a commodities business. You don't want to be there. Why? Well, it's a well-known economic fact. If all things are equal in a commodities business, whoever has the lowest price will get all the business. You don't want to be there. A new marketing adage for service business in this age is find one very unique service that's in demand, perform that service very well, perform that service very often. All right, let's take a closer look at a client nurturing program. They come with some essentials. The first essential is a complimentary initial consultation. You have to have one. Most lawyers do. All of my clients do. Dentists are now offering free initial exams. The same with optometrists. This trend may have started with the Internet. All the wonderful things Google has to offer are free. 
yet they make a bundle on the back end. There are free apps galore on the Internet. Why do you need to buy a, a set of encyclopedias when there's Wikipedia out there and it's free? It's actually better. It's updated almost daily. If you're not offering a complimentary initial consultation, especially to older existing clients who needed attention, you're going to be falling behind. A campaign mentality. Effective marketing and advertising efforts are called campaigns because they work over time. Very few make sense short term. They do work. We wouldn't be bombarded with advertising messages day after day if they didn't work. They work very well. Think of these campaigns as marathons, not, not sprints. Protecting uh, confidentiality. Well, because of the special relationship you have with your clients and potential clients, confidentiality is paramount. For example, you may not want to have your client list sent off to a mailing house. This is one reason the client nurturing programs require just a small amount of administrative work, and this is done by your own staff in your own office. No one outside of your staff needs to see your client list, and that includes me. Targeting 100% impressions. I know the, uh, the term impression is now used to describe clicking an ad on the Internet, but I'm going to use it here in, in a totally different context. A more traditional definition of impressions is when a targeted individual sees the message, pays attention to it, and understands its content. As you can imagine, most advertising has a very low impression rate, down in the single digits. Most ads go right over our heads, but you know what, they're still effective even with a low impression rate. The client nurturing uh, campaigns that I develop, we try for a 100% impression rate. So everyone we target receives and understands our message. A simple but very well organized structure. These campaigns can be controlled in your office with an Excel spreadsheet. This will allow progress to be measured and will keep embarrassing mistakes from happening. I believe in Murphy's Law, so I make sure a well-structured organizational system is in place at the launch of any client nurturing campaign. Now, I didn't add this uh, to the slide of essentials, but let me tell you about it. It's in regard to the, the development of an emotional bond with clients. Well, what does this mean? There's an old adage in marketing that goes like this. Products are sold on the merits of the product, its appearance, its function, its price. That's what I used to do, sell very nice products to very nice retailers. Services, on the other hand, are sold on the merits of the person, the person behind the service. Now, lawyers are certainly in the service business, so you want to be perceived as knowledgeable, capable, trustworthy. You want to be a trusted advisor, a partner, and a friend. You want your existing clients and your potential clients to respect you, and you want them to really like you. Now, this really like you part may sound uh, kind of corny, but this is the emotional bond you should always try to obtain. And also keep in mind that most financial decisions in the U.S. involving a husband and wife, the final decision is usually made by the wife. So whether you're a male or female, pay a lot of attention to the wife and make sure she really likes you. All right, where do we start? We always start with the existing clients. Take a good look at your client base. Now, some attorneys stay very close to their clients, most do not. Some attorneys may not want to stay close if you're a criminal defense attorney or maybe a bankruptcy attorney. I work primarily with estate planning attorneys who, generally speaking, should stay very close to their clients, but many do not. When I ask why not, I hear, well, I'm too busy uh, with new clients. Or I hear, I don't have time to try to call all of my old clients. Or I hear, I don't want to do anything. It will cause them all to come in at once. Or I hear, they know where I am. They can call me if they need anything. Or I hear, I tried to contact clients once and it fizzled out. Well, these are all excuses for not paying attention to your greatest asset, your clients, and ultimately your client database. So you start with your existing clients. Why? Because they know you. They trusted you at least once in the past. They paid the bills once before also, so they should be credit worthy for a second time. They know where you're located. 
a lot of goodwill was created the first time around. Was that goodwill wasted over the years of non-communication? And you haven't seen them in a while. They need attention. What do you do to get uh, existing clients, or what do you do with your existing clients? You invite them to come into your office for a complimentary meeting to review their estate plan. It's as simple as that. Why should they come in? Well, you know better than I do the various reasons that existing clients should see their estate planning attorneys. I think one of the most important reasons is a change in health for the client, the spouse, or children. As we all know, middle-aged people can have a change in health overnight. How would you know about a drastic change in a client's health unless he or she told you? His doctor surely is not going to call you up and tell you about somebody else's health. In, virtual, in virtually all of my documents, I mention the word health and how it's the client's responsibility to keep the estate planning attorney informed. There's another reason that estate planning attorneys and clients should meet, and it's not even on this list. It involves the stretching of inherited IRAs over the life expectancy of the designated beneficiary. With so many middle-aged and older workers retiring now with sizable IRAs, are they sure the beneficiary is even correct? For example, if they converted a traditional account to a Roth IRA, or for some other reason their IRA account now has a new account number, did they fill out a new beneficiary form properly? Does the beneficiary know what to do if he or she suddenly inherits an IRA? Do they know how to stretch it out over their life expectancy? Is this an important subject? Well, it was important enough for the Wall Street Journal to print a very interesting article entitled Hazards of Inheriting an IRA. And this ran just last Saturday, February 1st, three days ago. And the article was not written for attorneys, nor was it written for financial advisors. It was written for cons consumers. In other words, your clients. An article like this could raise questions in your cli clients' minds and a meeting with you could resolve these questions. Sequence. How do we proceed in inviting existing clients in for a meeting? Well, we already discussed you don't want them all arriving at once, and you don't want to create a lot of administrative work for your staff, so you develop a campaign. You take a good look at your client database. You decide on a criteria for reaching out to your clients. Is it three years? They haven't been in in three years. Or is it four years or five years? You haven't seen them in five years. Come up with the criteria. You total the number of clients you think need attention. Let's say, let's say it's 350. All right, how do we reach out to 350 existing clients without creating a lot of administrative work and upsetting the entire office? We start a campaign, as I mentioned. Let's say a good time frame for a campaign would be 10 weeks. During this time, 35 personal letters are mailed each week for 10 weeks, mailed by your own staff. That's right, you heard correctly. Good old-fashioned U.S. Postal Service snail mail first-class letters. We'll be sending the same letter to all 35 people. However, it can't look like a mass-produced document. It must look like a personal letter. Microsoft Mail Merge is great for this. In addition, the letter has to be hand-signed by you, the attorney. Even better if a brief note is put at the bottom of the letter in your own handwriting, further indicating that it's a personal letter. Use a pen with blue ink so it really doesn't look mass-produced. Now, I love email and Google and Constant Contact and LinkedIn and all the other forms of social media. And if I thought your clients, potential clients, were much younger, I'd be talking about a totally different approach today. But think about it for a minute. Your clients are probably older, middle-aged, and up. There is nothing, absolutely nothing, that will get their attention like a first-class personal letter from their attorney. Now, suppose for a minute that I'm a legal client and my mail arrives. Well, I get out my wastebasket because we all open our mail over our wastebasket or our shredder now, don't we? Into the basket goes a flyer about something. Into the basket goes a retail circular. In goes a promotion from, uh, from a bank. 
In goes the credit card application, although that probably ought to go on the shredder. Wait, what's this? It's a personal letter from my attorney. I better see what he wants. I open it up. It is a personal letter, and the attorney is signed in the bottom, and it looks like there's even a handwritten note to me at the bottom. This looks important. I better read it. You'll get close to 100% impressions using this technique. Now, what does the letter say? It's a friendly, dignified, very polite and professional invitation to visit the attorney, uh, visit you at your office for a complimentary consultation to review your estate plan. The letter starts off by saying, while reviewing our files, we noticed that your existing estate plan was executed in this office on whatever the date, June 2nd, 2002, and is overdue for a referral. Now, rest assured that we make it very clear in the letter that while the initial consultation is free, all ensuing law, uh, legal work is not free. After giving a number of reasons why a review is in order, the letter goes on to state that during the course of the review, if you decide that additional legal services are necessary, an estimate for legal work will be provided. Does this letter work? Yeah, it does. The average results of this letter are about 10% in appointments. Well, 10% doesn't sound like very much, but that's actually pretty good in direct mail marketing. Companies like Land's End, L.L. Bean, etc., run mailing campaigns that live and die around 2%. But if 10% of the people, which is 3 or 4 of the 35, may come in for appointment, how about the other 90% of the clients that don't respond? Well, I'd probably be in that 90% group. I'd read carefully my attorney's letter, and I'd think, well, he's probably right. Too much time has passed. I know the law has changed, and I've certainly had plenty of changes in my personal life and my financial status. I should go and see him. Then I'd probably put that letter into the basket on my desk, and 10 weeks later, the letter would still be in the basket. However, 10 to 12 weeks later, I'd receive a second letter from my attorney, and with it would be a copy of the first letter. The second letter would, would state, gee, I wrote to you uh, on, on a date 10 weeks ago about a complimentary consultation, then repeat the message. With, as I mentioned, with this letter would be a copy of the original letter. Now the light would go on. Now I think he's really serious about this. He seems to have all the dates correct. He obviously has copies of his own letters. What's going to happen if my wife, wife and I have passed away and my estate is all messed up, which it probably is? My kids will probably call this attorney and say, and say, we may have to pay an estate tax. And now many of the family assets have to go through probate court. This estate is all messed up. How could you have let this happen? My attorney would then pull out the letters out of the file, the letters he sent me. These letters indicate that I twice refused his offer for a free consultation. Do I want that to be my legacy? I'd be leaving behind a legacy that indicates that I was cavalier about my family's well-being and I couldn't be bothered to visit my attorney for a free consultation and update my estate plan. Think about it for a minute. This is where human psychology comes into play. Does the second letter arriving with a copy of the first letter work? It sure does. The second letter really gets the phone ringing. Average appointments made as a result of the second letter jumped to about 18%. By the way, 10 or 12 weeks later, there's a third letter that arrives repeating the same message. This letter is accompanied by copies of the first two letters. The average appointment rate made as a result of the third letter is around 17%. Now the 10 to 12 week lag time is important for another reason. It indicates that we have some respect for our clients and we're not trying to badger them. So now with 30 to 36 weeks into our first campaign, letter campaign, that's eight or nine months. So you can see these things work best over time. If there's no response from these letters, I advise calling the client to try to make sure that he's, he or she is not incapacitated or in a nursing home or something like that. An attractive benefit of these campaigns is that you control the pace. If you get very busy, you can slow down the campaign. 
I advise all my clients to shut down the mailings after the first week in December. There's just too much competition for attention in late December. However, the letters can still be generated during this time if the office staff has time. They just should be dated January 2nd and mailed shortly after the, the New Year starts. I mentioned that these letters are all the same. They've been carefully constructed and well tested over the years by all my clients. The campaigns I run with my different clients are virtually identical. It's like a franchise. A franchise is nothing more than a success story exactly copied in a new location. I've had several clients running identical campaigns in the same city with no problems. This is because their initial focus is with their existing clients and the referrals their existing clients bring in. Anniversaries. Once you've met with your clients and there's lots of goodwill floating around, put your clients on a client anniversary list. Decide when they should come in next, in three years, five years, and note that on your client database. You don't have to make an appointment three or five years out. Just note the month and date they should come back in to see you for review. Then later on, you search your database to see whose anniversary is coming up that month. And then you send them another nice letter, inviting them back in. Sophisticated database software like Microsoft Access make this easy. I mentioned earlier the best way to get referrals from clients is politely ask. One painless way of doing this is using a small card we call a referral card or an introduction card. This looks like a cross between a business card and a wedding invitation. It has your firm's name, address, phone number, and most importantly, your website address. Lawyers have to have an impressive website. Just about everyone will check out your website before they call you. This is where Amicus Creative excels. I don't know of anyone who does a better job at creating and maintaining websites for attorneys than Amicus. Now, back to this card. It has a, a short printed message that states that entitles the holder to a complimentary initial consultation at your office. You simply give two or three of these cards to each client as they leave and ask them to pass them along. The card can be a simple plain card, or it could be a fancy card on heavy paper with an embossed, an embossed border. It doesn't matter. Just make sure it's larger than the size of a business card, and it will fit into a business envelope. It should be bigger than a business card, so it doesn't get stuck in the pile with all the, the other business cards. Ideal, the client will pass these cards on to a friend, associate, or maybe even to a daughter and son-in-law who should have an estate plan. Who better, than to take care of, who better to take care of them than the family attorney? It's, it's, it's another case of playing the odds. If you pass out 20 or 30 cards and three or four people redeem them and come in for a meeting, there's three or four appointments you wouldn't have had uh, if you didn't pass out the cards. A client satisfaction survey is a one-page document with five simple questions. You can ask your client to complete uh, this document, this uh, survey at your office, or you give it to them with, a, say, a stamped self-addressed envelope to take home. This survey is a spin-off of the famous uh, Net Promoter System developed by Bain and Company, and that is being used everywhere, no matter what business you're in. It tells you everything you need to know about how your business is doing. One question is known as the ultimate question, and it goes like this. How likely would you be to recommend this law firm, your law firm, to a family member, friend, or a colleague? Now, the answer to this question are in numbers on a scale, with definitely would, you definitely would recommend this law firm, being the highest number, and definitely would not, being the lowest number. Because the numbers are, I'm sorry, because the answers are numbered, the survey can be quantified, it can be measured, recorded, and used as a target for, for future improvement. Now, you don't need to get back all the surveys to form a conclusion. A very small percentage can be considered a statistically accurate sample and tell you exactly 
how all of your other clients feel. Taking a very small sample and extrapolating the results is precisely how television networks predict the winners of major U.S. elections. At the bottom of the survey is a, a small space for clients to, quote, comment about their experience with the law firm, end of quote. Then we ask, may we have your permission to use your comments in our promotional literature? There are two blo uh, blocks next to that. One block is yes, and the next, the other block is no. Well, during, during a two-year period, I was able to come up with over 60 positive testimonials for just one law firm. All of them contain the client's initials, their hometown, the date, and their written permission to use their words. Hometowns are important, so prospective clients know the comments are coming from their neighbors. Dates are important, so prospective clients know the testimonials are not 10 to 15 years old. Now, it's rare that a negative comment comes back in, but if they do, they should be brought immediately to the, the attorney's attention. They usually involve a misunderstanding of some kind, and the, the attorney can quickly fix this. Professional courtesy notifications are simple letters that my clients send to their clients, CPAs, financial advisors, wealth counselors, etc. Of course, they're sent with the client's permission. They state that, quote, as a courtesy, I'm letting you know that your client, Mr. and Mrs. John Smith, had their estate plan modified and recently updated. The final draft was executed in my office on January 2nd, uh, January 20th, say 2014. Mr. and Mrs. Smith have signed versions of all documents, and of course, signed copies are on file in my office. Please call me if you have any questions. The financial professionals appreciate this information. And to you, it's a subtle form of advertising. Getting your firm's name in front of important people reinforces what's known as top of mind exposure. The only advertising I sometimes suggest is state bar publications. These would be notifying other attorneys that you're available for referrals and consultations. These ads are usually very inexpensive and are seen by thousands of attorneys and some people on the fringe uh, like me. Okay, I'm going to quickly go through some other areas that I think can be very helpful to you. I, they're not on slides, but I'll just run through them quickly. Interviews. I conduct interviews of my clients, my attorneys, for local publications, for their newsletters or mailings. I ask questions that lead to answers not found in a lawyer's biography. Questions like, why did you become an attorney? What do you enjoy most about practicing law? What do you enjoy the least? What do you do with your free time? Most people will read this kind of information before they read legal jargon. Here's a quick story. About 35 years ago, Time Magazine had an enormous circulation. They decided to take a survey of their readers to see what section of the magazine their readers went to first once they received their weekly copy. They found out that most readers went directly to a page called People. You've probably seen it. It's information, good and bad, on movie stars, athletes, and other celebrities. And someone at Time had a bright idea and said, why don't we create an entire magazine about this stuff? Thus, People Magazine was born, and Time Incorporated made a fortune. People love to read personal information about other people. So an attorney being interviewed by an independent marketing consultant, that would be me, can be very impactful. Newsletters to clients and professional, uh, other uh, financial professionals can be very helpful. You don't have to do them every month. Quarterly is fine. Paper newsletters tend to be expensive, but they're effective. Constant contact uh, email newsletters are more affordable. That is, if you have everyone's email address, but they also can be deleted in a heartbeat. An occasional white paper can be very helpful. This is an in-depth analysis of a legal issue that your clients and referral sources uh, might want to know about. High net worth clients are used to 
have seen things like this and they love them. Conversion campaigns. Let's say you do some real estate work on the site, it shouldn't be that hard to, con uh, to convert your real estate clients into estate planning clients. And one way of doing it is, say, six, four to six months after a real estate uh, arrangement closes, you simply contact the client and say, now that your house is in order, let's take a look at your estate plan. Closing skills. A lot of attorneys need help with closing skills. Books have been written about this. There's probably another term for this in the legal profession, but we call it in sales and marketing, we call them closing skills. A very basic one is asking for the order. You don't have to be that abrupt. You can use words like to the client. You can say, you're in a very interesting situation, and I know I can be of great help. I'd love to be your estate planning attorney. You're asking for the order. Another interesting closing technique is to identify any objections and then remove those objections. Let's say a major objection involves money, and it usually does. You can help eliminate that uh, uh, objection. How do you do that? Well, maybe with an extended payment plan. Instead of asking for $2,000 or $4,000 or $6,000 all at once, there's a simple way to let your clients pay you off over time, over a three, four, five month period. It'll cost you a few points with the bank, but it's better than letting the client walk away. I think I'm starting to run out of time. Um, so I'll be happy. Um, so let me summarize anyway. I'll be happy to help you start a, a client nurturing campaign. Uh, keep in mind, this is a very low cost, but highly effective method of building your practice into a healthy and prosperous entity. You'll be paying for postage and a small amount of administration. I ask for uh, a very modest fee in the form of a monthly retainer to train your staff and provide the well-tested correspondence and collateral materials. I'll provide an effective uh, organizational structure, and I'll man manage the campaign to ensure success. My fees are low because my concepts and materials are, already exist and have been well tested. Your staff does a small amount of administrative work needed. I manage the campaign and keep things on track. You'll be spending your time meeting with clients. Now, I understand with this information I've provided today, you probably could try this on your own. However, you won't have the well-tested correspondence, the collateral materials, the timing, timing sequence, and maybe most importantly, the organizational structure. This is important because there are times you'll have a first letter, second letter, maybe a third letter all going out together. And the last thing you want is to have a client respond to one of these letters, say they respond to the first letter, they come in and have a nice meeting and they get their, their legal needs taken care of. The last thing you want is to have that client get a, a letter 10 weeks later saying, we haven't seen you in five or six years. Like I said, uh, these things can happen. You don't want to spend your time trying to manage an un unfamiliar marketing campaign. Your time is valuable and is best spent meeting with clients. I have one client who regularly has uh, four very high quality appointments per day, five days a week, week after week. If you'd like to talk more about this, I'll be happy to talk, just talk to you. Simply send me an email uh, and tell me a good time to call you. Uh, my email address, and this is going to appear on the very last slide, so you don't really have to write it down. But my email address is Brian, B-R-I-A-N-M-C-C-1, that's numeral one, at cox, C-O-X dot net. And just tell me a good time to call. I'll email you back to confirm the time, and if it's a conflict for me, I'll let you know. We can pick another time. And as I said, my email address uh, will appear on, the, on this very last slide. There's no charge, of course, for this call or any other time we need to set up a, a, a client nurturing program. After we talk, I'll send you a, a short written proposal in writing, uh, along with copies of about a dozen positive testimonials from my attorney clients so you can share this information with your partners or anyone else. I probably should have mentioned earlier there are no contracts involved with me. Uh, I'm pretty easy to work with. Well, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, I appreciate the time you spent with me.
I hope good things happen to you and your law practice in 2014. I think we're going to open things up now for questions. Um, is that correct, Vicki? Yeah. And we do have um, a few questions that did come in during the course of the presentation. Uh, the first one actually was a comment uh, that we encounter all the time. We get from attorneys when we're talking about advertising on a website. And something I was hoping that you could address, and that was this um, idea and belief, really, that free consultations are often just a way for uh, prospects and clients to come in and have the attorney's brain picked. And what would you say to that? All right, I understand the question that uh, that uh, advertising brings in, or uh, promotion, marketing in general, brings in people that uh, are just trying to pick the brain of an attorney. Uh, you want people coming in. You're going to, there's a certain percent I have nothing to do probably, possibly and, and I'm going to waste your time. But you want people constantly coming in. Uh, I've been to seminars where I know, and it's a, it's a well-known fact that in a lot of seminars people are there for the food. Well, that's a fact of life you have to live with because uh, the, the other people are there for a reason and you don't know who's, who's there and what their reason is, so you have to live, live with that. You want people coming in to your office. You want to bond with them. You want to uh, be able to try to help them. And you may have to live with people who are coming in occasionally, coming in to pick your brain. Okay, thank you. And in terms of, you mentioned sending out these uh, three different letters to clients and how important it is for attorneys to write a personal note on these letters. What kind of note are, are you talking about? Do you have some examples that you might share in terms of what's been effective? Yeah, it would be something very short, short and sweet at the very bottom of the page, and if you can address the client by name, if you're familiar with enough to address them by their first name, uh, Bob and Mary, uh, please call me, or uh, Jack, this is important. Something very nice to indicate that uh, you've not only signed a letter, but you cared enough to put a little personal note at the letter. Again, you want the client, uh, the existing client, to receive this letter and think it's a, a, just a strictly a personal letter. Uh, to them. It is, and it really is. It's a personal letter to that particular client. You're just start sending out a bunch of other identical letters to other, which are personal letters to other clients. So the answer to your question, I think, is the uh, a little anything at the bottom to indicate that you're concerned uh, and that this really is a, 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 a serious a personal letter. Okay, great. And in terms of that, after the, the round of three letters, and you said it's so important to keep your database um, refreshed and up to date. So after the three letters, if you don't hear any sort of response, how should you proceed at that point? Just remove them altogether or mark them inactive? No, you can mark them uh, inactive. I wouldn't delete them. Unless you found out somebody uh, has been deceased and there's no, I mean, there's no uh, future with that certainly that client or the family, uh, you could delete, you know, remove them from your database. But uh, if you just didn't hear from somebody, it may be a case where that's, that's, the bad, that's a bad time for them. This year isn't right. Again, we can do these uh, campaigns on and on as time goes by, and maybe next year you get a different response. So just because you didn't hear from them uh, doesn't mean they should be deleted at all. Uh, only delete people that you know uh, and you have a good reason uh, for deleting them. If they moved away or if they tell you they get a new attorney, or if they moved, you know, 3,000 miles away and, and uh, that's where they will spend the rest of their life, uh, the odds of you being your attorney are slim, but they can tell you that uh, so it be okay to delete those people. But, again, if you just haven't heard from them over a period of time, I, I'll, leave them, I'll leave them open. Okay. And this is going to be our last question for now. I know um, we don't want to keep you too long here, but... Um, in terms of maintenance programs, they have gained a lot of traction in the world of estate planning um, in the past few years. And in your experience, of course, these maintenance programs are a form of client nurturing, but do firms often run these types of campaigns that you're saying in addition to a maintenance program that they offer, or is it usually one or another in your experience? Uh, it's usually one or another, Vicki. A good maintenance program, and I know I, I think most of the maintenance programs are 
uh, they char you're charging the clients. Uh, they should be run. They should be first class. And a lot of things we talked about today uh, should should be covered. Now, I added some other marketing benefits and things that you probably don't you don't get it with a maintenance program. But I don't think you need to do both. Uh, some again, some of the marketing techniques uh, can be helpful. But, uh, if you don't have a maintenance program in place, and I know they're costly, and uh, some of the clients don't like. Uh, they think of them as uh, you know, service plans, or uh, and they, they don't really uh, want to get involved. Uh, if you don't have any of that place, then a client nurturing program, like I described uh, this afternoon, I think would be a natural for an estate planning. And when I say estate planning, it's usually most of my clients usually work in elder law and also probate administration. So uh, these campaigns can be very effective, uh, not to compete with a, a maintenance program. Okay, great. Well, I think that's all we have in terms of questions here. I did want to go ahead and extend a giant thank you to Brian for your wonderful presentation uh, this afternoon. It was very informative. Um, and Brian, could you just go ahead? I know you said your email address before, but if you could go ahead and show that on the screen here and uh, just give our attendees a bit more information about contacting you, that would be great. Yep. Yeah, it's right there at the bottom. It's Brian, B-R-I-A-N, M-C-C-1, -C numeral 1, at cox, C-O-X, dot net, N-E-T. And you're certainly welcome, Vicki. I hope I was helpful to, to everyone. Yeah, absolutely. And like I said at the beginning of this presentation, um, Brian is a, a great person just to brainstorm with. And all of our clients who have worked with him have had absolutely wonderful experiences. And they've been very forthcoming in terms of sharing their success. Um, so we certainly would, would encourage you to reach out to Brian. Uh, and like I said at the start, we did uh, record this, and I will be sending you a follow-up email uh, with the link to the recording in case you do want to share it with any colleagues or review it again when it comes time for you to implement your client nurturing program. Um, so as we go ahead and we, we wrap up here, you will find a survey as you exit the webinar just asking you a few questions about your time with us this afternoon. I hope you'll take just a few moments to complete that and give us your feedback. Uh, again, thank you to Brian, and thank you all so much to all of our attendees today. Hope you enjoy the rest of your day.